from the campus studios of Sarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hello listeners and welcome to another Ropecast, a podcast about everything to do with the English language. And today I have a new guest in the studio, I'd like to welcome Heike, Hi. who is a colleague of mine. Good to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> We want to talk initially about a word, just a word in the English language. And I remember very well when I was at school myself, 11 years old, started learning French. One of the first things I had to try to work out was, isn't it strange that nouns in French are masculine or feminine? <laughs> so, for example, the sun is masculine and the moon is feminine. How weird. And then the next year I started learning German. <laughs> and I found, okay. no, the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine and then we have neuter as well. And, you know, this was my introduction to the meaning of the word gender. Gender was something grammatical. Some languages have gender for nouns, for example, or even for adjectives. Yeah, and things have kind of moved on since then. <laughs> A little bit, yes, <laughs> I'd hope so. So that uh, we look at the situation today, okay, that use of the word gender is still around. I mean, linguists or grammarians Obviously, would still yeah. speak about grammatical gender. The other word that needs to be brought in here is sex, because, you know, on my birth certificate, there's a little thing that says sex, and then there's M or F, and for me, it's M. Mm -hmm. And very often through the years when I've had to fill out a form, there's been a similar thing, it just says sex. And you don't write, yes, please, or anything like that, you write... <laughs> Male, no, female. thank you, we're British. <laughs> oh, that, yes. <laughs> so, um, and of course now in our department, we have something called gender studies, mm -hmm. which has very little to do with grammar. Yep, <laughs> right? very little to do with official forms. <laughs> right. So perhaps you could just explain to our listeners a little bit where what's happened in the meantime over this period of 30 years or something. Okay. I think I'm going to have to start in the 1970s, because that's usually the time when we talk about this um, distinction between sex and gender, because before that, the terms were kind of used more or less interchangeably very could often. Be, yeah. And in the 1970s, an article came out uh, by a woman called Gail Rubin, who made the very distinction between sex being an, a biological category or an right. anatomical and gender being a social construct. Right. Um, but ever since, obviously, that distinction has been challenged uh, mm. by numerous people. And the most famous of all is, of course, Judith Butler. Yes. Um, and um, today, when we use the term gender in you know, a gender studies kind of context, what we usually say is gender is performative, meaning it is not who you are, but what you do. Mm -hmm. right? And that includes everything from the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you sit down, the way you act in public, the mm -hmm. way you look at other people, the way other people look at you. Um, everything, basically. Mm -hmm. right? So it's always a kind of lived um, everyday sort of performance that and that's the new thing about that way of understanding gender is it can be changed and it can be right. changed by you yourself. Whereas you, sex... You would say it is a social construct. Definitely, yeah. But Butler's definition as such goes even further because if you're thinking about social constructs, they can change, but it takes a long time yeah. usually, right? They're fluid uh, and unstable. But for a social discourse to change, that's usually a thing that happens within generations and generations. Yeah. Whereas if you think of gender as a performance then it becomes a very a very flexible thing mm. that you could even change within a day. You, yes. could, you could go to a um, drag queen or a drag king workshop and you could learn how to perform a different kind of gender. Mm. Or you could learn how to confuse people by um, performing your gender in a different way. So right. say you change your hairstyle, you, you change the way you speak, you change the way that you shake hands, you know, just teeny tiny things like that mm. will throw people off, you know, for just for a moment and think about, um, wait, wait a moment, was that, that's a very feminine thing to do there, or that's a very masculine thing to do, why did the person do that now, mm -hmm. right? And in a nutshell, you could claim that that's more or less uh, what gender activism is about. Yeah. yeah. What about, how has officialdom responded to all of this? I mentioned form filling in my younger yeah. days, and it was quite clear, male, female, um, those were the only categories available. And I mean, in most cases, that's still the way it is, right? Mm. I mean, 
even if you it's the most ridiculous the most absurd situations where you have to declare your gender like you say you want a new contract for your mobile phone or um you want to change um energy providers or whatever it is really mm -hmm. for you know the most absurd and i mean the most absurd being really marketing reasons right mm -hmm. i think for the most part because i think that's really where gender is still the one of the most um uh important categories as such as marketing right um but I think some governments have tried or have, you know, are slowly moving towards um, the idea that maybe it'd be good to introduce a third or even more, you know, boxes on official forums yeah. that would either include like trans or inter people yeah. or to make, you know, to have the choice that you don't want to specify it at all and just mm. have like an empty box that is something between male and female. The problem with that obviously is that if you have three boxes as such, you do still maintain the binary, yeah. right? Because you have the the two things that are right, and then you have the thing that's strange in the middle, mm. and that's what I don't really like about that approach either. Because you're not really changing the system; you're just tweaking it a little. Just a final point for today: that is, um, in English, anything that is in English, you'll see LGBT. These four letters, the, yeah, capital letters, the famous alphabet. Suit. And <laughs> <laughs> I've been searching to see if there's anything similar in German, and I haven't found anything. Now we say LGBTQ. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. um, does I that mean does that mean Germany is a little bit behind the yeah, times, or what is it? Yeah, no, it it really is. Uh -huh. We're 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 kind of still, we're tagging along with like you know English speaking countries, particularly the UK mm. and the US, but we're still lagging behind in a lot of ways. I mean, if you look at when gender studies appeared on the agenda and when the first gender studies departments opened in universities, it's always in the English in the English speaking world. And mm -hmm. I mean, we've just now last year introduced a gender studies certificate at Saarland University, right. and I remember that you know when I began my studies back in I don't want to say <laughs> but back in the days right um, I remember that Professor Frank of all people was the first person to introduce me to gender studies mm. and he kept saying oh yeah no this is kind of like it's a bit of an old hat really you know and I was like gender what gender huh <laughs> you know and now I'm, I'm kind of proud to say that obviously you know things have changed and mm. There's been a lot going on um, at Ireland University in terms of gender activism and gender right. research, but we've only just managed to channel all of those efforts and put them into one official, you know, institutionalized sort of thing, and that's the new gender studies certificate. Well, that's clearly going to be the topic for our next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Heike, for sure. today. And I'll invite you back very soon. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to Ropecast. Brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial. <laughs>